poverty. Everyone has seen it. The trash. The sewage. The tin can houses. The mud huts. We hear about the corruption of governments, and the genocides, and the wars, and on and on. These are the things that we think of when we hear of poverty. And yes, all of these things are true, and they are horrible, and we as human beings should take more notice of it. This cycle of poverty has existed since the beginning and has not yet been broken. But this is not what our story is about. The world wishes of this world continue to send money and food, yet after centuries, the cycle of poverty remains. And while this method is keeping millions of people alive, it lacks a permanent, sustainable end. Loan sharks who charge over 300% in interest rates have been the only option. There is, however, a different way. Not a cycle, but a way out. Indigenous organizations are giving out loans as small as a few dollars. These small loans can help start or boost their own businesses which generate an income that brings them closer to sustainability. Unlike the loan sharks, the average interest rate is only 10%. This movement is known as microfinance. Microfinance, let's think of that as financial services for the poor. So think about um, the things that your, your bank provides for you, and that includes savings and loans and insurance and all those little products. Think of how those would be tailored to the needs of somebody that makes a few dollars a day. Microcredit, if you will, fits under the broader scheme of micro finance, microcredit specifically, are the loans that go out to the very poor who have otherwise no access to credit. It's worth noting this has been around for a long time. I mean, people have been providing small loans to each other in various forms forever. The modern movement of microfinance is accredited to a man in Bangladesh named Dr. Mohammed Yunus. Since 1976, this model has spread throughout the developing world. It has changed the approach that organizations take towards poverty alleviation. There is a shift. There is a shift. And really, the old way has been exactly what, um, what I mentioned earlier, that there is a very top-down approach to development. And a new way is simply a bottom-up approach to development. And it's changing, it's transforming. Specifically, the IMF, the World Bank, all those major institutions are now changing a lot of their approaches towards poverty eradication. Kiva is a web-based organization that was co-founded by Jessica Flannery. Through their website, anyone can give a microcredit loan to indigenous entrepreneurs all over the developing world. Since the inception in October of 2006, they have given over $30 million in loans. People browse these profiles and are able to lend as little as $25 to the loan need. Kiva passes that money along to these microfinance institutions all around the world that we partner with that then actually does the real hard work and administers the loan to the goat herder or the seamstress that that lender has specified. You know, it trains them, collects your payments, does all of the real in the field, on the ground work. Throughout the whole course of it, lenders are hearing how things are going. So they're getting repayment updates. Ideally, they're getting some qualitative stuff too, like a, a photo of, you know, the new goat or the new sewing machine. and anecdotal uh, stories about how, how things are changing in that person's life and in their family's life. An up-and-coming organization is the 1010 Project, founded by Andrew Syed. Started in May of 2003, out of his basement in Colorado, 1010 has built partnerships and friendships with different community leaders in East Africa. What we do with 1010 is we don't go into a country and start something new, but we connect with people who are already working in their own communities. There's this great myth about the African continent that they're kind of standing there with their hands open, waiting for everyone else to come and save them. And that is just not true. 
Everywhere we have gone, we have found communities that are already working amongst themselves to break the cycle of poverty. And so in short, what we do is we help people start small businesses. We, we work with these local organizations, small loans are given out, and people start small businesses. Over the last four and a half years, we've helped start almost 300 businesses that provide income for families, income that people use to buy food, safe water, provide education for their families, so on and so forth. The reason we work in the microcredit, microfinance uh, field is not because that's what we intended necessarily to do, but we found that was already working uh, amongst local communities. So for example, community-based organizations, CBOs, were uh, already engaged in trying to uh, generate a pool of resources that they could loan out to some of their members, and we were just able to come alongside, build a partnership, and grow uh, a pool of resources so that more loans could be given out and more businesses started. Uh, more people than obviously coming out of poverty. Tenten's work is primarily focused in Kenya, which is situated in East Africa. It is surrounded by Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan, Uganda, Rwanda, and Tanzania. The population is near 40 million. The capital, Nairobi, was originally a watering hole for the Maasai tribe until the British settled there when building a railway from Mombasa to Uganda. It is now the largest city between Cairo and Johannesburg. Ten Ten's main representative in Kenya is Fred Afwai. He and his wife Alice operate a church and an orphanage. They are the country representatives for two non-government organizations or NGOs. They have founded a network of CBO leaders who meet once a month and collaborate with one another, finding solutions to the problems that hinder their prosperity. In all the organizations that I work with, I usually come out with a, the network issue to make these people know each other, help each other, and see what each other are doing. We encourage each other, we give advices to where we can give advices. So the, mainly that's uh, what I do. Michael Nyangi is 28. He started a community-based organization, or CBO, known as Lomoro, which is located in the second largest slum in the world, Kibera. He has helped start over 60 businesses in the last three years. Michael and Fred partner with Andrew to form a network of indigenous entrepreneurs and community-based organizations. They have dedicated their lives to breaking the cycle of poverty. Through the work of these three individuals, we will explore a small portion of what microfinance is doing in one section of the world. Everyone knows about Kibera. It's the world's largest slum and 1.5 million people and so on and so forth. But in the middle of Kibera is a friend of ours, Michael Nyangi, and he's a young guy who uh, came to Kibera from up country uh, looking for work. He's found training as a CPA and, and he looked around again and, and saw a lot of need, uh, orphans and, and HIV and poverty and, and really wanted to do something about it. And so as a CPA and someone that's interested in, in finance and numbers, he started a, a CBO called Lamoro and they started with just a few members. Uh, five to ten members, all were giving about 20 shillings. Uh, since then, he's expanded his CBO to some almost 100 members. They've started over 60 businesses, and some of them are, are, are large, if you will, and some of them just small kiosks along the side of the road. But they each one represent people who are taking small steps coming out of poverty. And Michael is really the one responsible for that. And his dream is to open a bank. Uh, eventually that will really specifically target those who are very, very poor uh, so they can have access to credit to uh, just get a chance at life, if you will. Before giving the loan, we normally uh, educate these people who now to start the business, uh, ways of doing the business and we have to go and see 
what the person is doing. There are some people who are already uh, started, who are already doing the business, and some are also willing to start the business. As you know that in Kibera, most of the businesses are just along the road, uh, where people are just selling some of them uh, vegetables. Some have got small canteens, some uh, groceries. We have got the carpenters, the carpentry along the road. Some are also selling compacts and CDs, and people come and buy, and it's through that that they normally manage to cater for their meals, pay for their household, and also to care for, for their children. Microloans are the result of individuals joining a CBO because they recognize the need for potential growth. These individuals usually have their own business started, yet are unable to grow it due to lack of access to financial services. As a new member, who is, is, is willing to join Lomoro. He has seen what the Benfica Lomoro are doing and he is somehow very much interested to, to, to join Lomoro. You can see how people within the slums are very, very busy because if you are not very busy then you, can, you cannot make a living. So this is now what they are now doing. But you see they are now doing it in, a, in, a, in an open place, which means when it is raining, um, when it is too hot then they cannot work. So I think um, yeah, Lomoro will come in once you will join Lomoro, then from there we'll see if, if you realize more money, then we'll be able to, to help them so that at least they can work under, under, under building. Yeah, my name is Maurice. Yeah, I'm a carpenter. This is uh, the part of the job we do. We have a lot of experience and knowledge to do so many different things, but lack of money. So you can't afford because most of our customers, they lack ready-made. Eh? They come for ready-made uh, things. When they come, they ask for the price for the things you have made. So we get hard time sometimes when we don't can't have enough cash to spend on the material and the things. Uh, the, the other thing, the type of the job you are doing, it needs machine work. If we can manage to get these small machines, I think it can make us prosper. The way Michael has structured Lamoro is it's his job, it's what he does, and so uh, the proceeds, if you will, that are coming in from the loans, some of the interest uh, on these loans is how he gets paid, and he spends his days uh, checking up on them, offering consulting, offering advice, making sure that uh, the businesses are moving forward as they should. Another common method that CBOs use is a group lending model. The major difference of this model is that the group collectively decides who will be given the loans and no one takes a salary. We have individuals who come together. They share their problems together. When they share their problems together, they ask of how can we do to solve our problems. Some of them, they start by having a group, asking a group to contribute some money. When they contribute some money, Within the group, they start to loan people some money to either expand their businesses or start their businesses. As they continue to refund the money, they will now give to other people in the group. Most of these really employs the members to make decisions. And so the pool of money is sitting there, and there is leadership. There is a president of the CBO, if you will. There's a treasurer, so on and so forth. Uh, but the membership sort of makes a decision on who gets the next round of loans. But in each of these, there has to be um, research done and thought done into, you know, thought committed to what are you going to do with this loan and, and how are you going to be able to pay the loan back and how are you going to have a business that's sustainable over the long, long haul. Individuals find a trustworthy group of people to network with. Mother's Concern is a CBO voluntarily operated by Immaculate Mwangi. Partnering alongside Lomoro, Mother's Concern offers microfinance services and trains young women with different skill sets in order to provide for their families. It's very hard to get a job in Kenya. There are so many ranted people in Kenya by their job race. Okay, it's hard. <laughs> I've never been <laughs> employed, so <laughs> I can't tell. Mostly I do businesses. If people are in the slums and they are left to look for jobs, they will not get the jobs because the jobs are not there. That's why we encourage people now to be starting small 
businesses that can help them earn a living and that's what most of our viewers have been doing and they have been uh, doing very well. So that's why we normally tell our people that instead of looking white collar job, then they will engage themselves in business that at least can help them now to earn a living so that you'll find that at the end of the day, somebody can pocket something in. Beatrice operates a takeaway food business in Kayole. So she was given 1,000 and the business is doing very well so far. Uh, if she can get another loan, she can even do better. She can so that she can feed these children. There is this group of people that is often really unbanked, and it's frequently because they have no collateral. You know, you, if you really start to imagine what someone's life has been like and what generations before them, you know, what their family's lives have been like, there are not a lot of assets, if you will, um, that they can go take to a bank and then use as collateral to get a loan and to have an opportunity to do something more. So for a lot of those folks, microfinance is the only option. In Kenya, to open an account is a lot of money. For example, you might, you might find that most of the banks, they will need at least 1,500 or 2,000 for somebody now to have an account with them. And people are now in the slums for them to get this 2,000 at a time will take them time. It's not very, very easy. When you're poor, there's no money to save. And, you know, we always talk about, well, people wouldn't be poor if they could put some money aside and save for the long term. Well, that's fine and all when you have expendable income to actually put aside and, and then obviously practice the discipline of saving. But when you live on less than a dollar a day, how much can you realistically put aside uh, when uh, basic life you know, survival each day is, is so raw. When we hear that someone lives on less than one US dollar a day, that figure is normally found by using the purchasing power parity. This equation compares the price of a basket of goods between two countries. Therefore, one dollar a day is actually one dollar a day. It's, it's an imperfect science to be sure, but it, su it suggests that uh, you know, when we say someone is earning or living on a dollar a day or less, it gives us something to grab a hold to and reference to and say, ah, that's almost, if not completely impossible to live on a dollar a day. How do they do it? You know, well, these are the poorest of the poor. Those who live below the poverty line are said to live in absolute poverty. Absolute poverty is defined by the lack of access to basic essential needs. Microfinance institutions provide the poor with financial services in hopes that through this process, their other needs will be met. It is common for CBOs to partner with and receive additional funding from NGOs. Michael partners with 1010. He uses the money to provide microcredit loans to the members of Lomoro. Uh, we just... Uh... The, 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 the husband died just recently. Uh -huh. She's staying down near in the slums. I approached her and she was very interested to start a business. Okay. I was with her here in the morning and he told me that he wanted to start a business just close here, 